Good morning and welcome to Cincy Lifestyle on this Friday. We've made it through another week, eh, Mona? That's right, Clyde. We have. And you know what? I'm excited that today is Friday, the weekend's coming. And you know, as things open up more and more, there's a few more things that you can do. So people will enjoy those things safely. There's yeah. handy. Yeah, but we're, we still got to encourage people to be careful out there because we are noting that in some instances, folks get just a little too exuberant and then you start to find spikes. Um, you are so right, Clyde. You are so right. And, um, but you know, and you know what? Some people taking their dogs for a walk. And speaking of dogs, um, we celebrated a birthday this week, you know, from the top dog on the show. And there's another birthday that's making headlines, <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> a golden retriever <laughs> in No, no Oakland, Mona, we celebrated, <laughs> we celebrated an old goat earlier this week, oh. and now we're getting to the dog. <laughs> well, this golden retriever in Oakland, Tennessee, has officially been dubbed the world's oldest golden retriever, August celebrated her 20th birthday on April 24th, and it was confirmed last week that she is the oldest of her breed of golden retrievers. And golden retrievers typically, Clyde, have a lifespan of 10 to 12 years, so 20 years is a lot. We are so glad about that. Oh, and Do you she's have a just favorite a dog breed? Um, yes. Uh, have... I tend to like larger dogs, so I've had a German, some German Shepherds. I had a Boxer, loved them, and was trying to get a uh, Schnauzer, uh, never did that never worked out, but yeah, I tend to like larger breeds. Oh, all right. Yeah, I'm the smaller <laughs> poodly mix kind of dog person. Yep. Yep. Dogs. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> Mona, we're going to we're going to learn something this morning that I that I think will surprise a lot of people. If you have a love for ceramics or an affinity towards fine china. Well, this next story is for you. Did you know? that Ohio is home to the National Museum of Ceramics. Yep, that's right. It is uh, less than an hour drive away from downtown Cincinnati. And here now to talk with us more about it is Susan Weaver. She's the director of the Museum of Ceramics. Susan, thank you for talking to us this morning. Oh, well, you're welcome. Good morning. Good morning to you. I'm going to start with a question I asked you in the beginning. How did such a museum like this land here? Well, East Liverpool was once the pottery capital of the nation. So we've had over 200 operating potteries in this area. So in 1980, they decided to build a museum that uh, preserved the history and presented it to the community. Uh, so that, that's why it was chosen for here. East Liverpool was known as the crockery city or the ceramic city. Uh, nearly everyone who lived here worked in a pottery or knew someone who worked in a pottery. Well, that is, that's absolutely fascinating. Now, tell us about uh, Lotus Ware. Uh, wh wh what is that? Yeah, Lotus Ware is actually probably the finest bone china ever made in the United States. Uh, and it was only made for a couple of years in the 1890s. Uh, and you're seeing there some Lotus Ware jewelry just went by from broken pieces of uh, Lotus Ware. But, um, it was made by KT and K, Knowles Taylor Knowles, which was East Liverpool's largest pottery. And it's very fine, delicate ware, uh, mostly art pottery, such as vases and candy dishes, very collectible. And the museum has the largest public display of it. We have over 200 pieces on display. Okay, let's talk about another exhibit you have. It's called Images of Rock Springs Park. What's that? And, and, and why is that such a prominent exhibit? Thank you. Well, we do a temporary exhibit every year. We try to do something to for people who've been here before, hoping they'll come back. So this year we did the Rock Springs Park exhibit. Uh, that was an amusement park that was across the river in Chester, West Virginia. And uh, it operated from the late 1800s until 1970 when it was torn down for a highway to go through. But especially local people have very fond memories of this beautiful trolley park that operated here and people from all over came to this park. So it's just sort of a walk down memory lane to see, uh, to come in and see this exhibit. It'll be up until the end of August. Okay. And right quick, what's the ooh ah moment for most people when they tour? 
Well, we have two floors, and the first floor is about the history of the industry, and uh, then, but then when you go downstairs, it's about production. So when you walk downstairs, you just enter a, a 1900 jigger shop where the ware was shaped, uh, a, a bottle kill where it was fired, and a decorating shop. Uh, so it's it really brings it to life to see these full size dioramas with full size uh, figures in them. Okay, that's that... the ooh. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, that's the <laughs> boy we're having some fun aren't we <laughs> so let's do this let's help folks find where you are and how they can get more information okay we are in east liverpool ohio and the best place to go is to our website and it's the museum of ceramics.com uh, don't forget the the at the beginning it's all one word the museum of ceramics.com also like us on facebook that's where we put about all of our events and and a little tidbits usually every day. Okay. All right, Susan, I apologize for the bumpy landing, but thank you so much for talking to us this morning. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Allie? Did you know that you don't have to wait till Halloween to dress up like your favorite character? Cosplay brings you that opportunity year round, and there's one local high school art teacher who's no, who knows a thing or two about that world. Allie has the story. Go ahead, Allie. Cosplay. What is it and where did it begin? Cosplay is the combination of costume and play and is the practice of dressing up as a fictional character. The first recording of fan costuming dates back to the early 20th century in Cincinnati, Ohio. Mr. and Mrs. Fell dressed up at a skating masquerade as a popular science fiction Martian, Mr. Skygack, and Miss Dill Pickles. From then on, the commitment and creativity to dressing up in a costume grew into a global phenomenon, with conventions, conferences, and competitions. Just ask Brian Harmon, a born maker and local high school teacher, how much time and dedication it takes. So a head-to-toe costume like this will take me a couple months to work on because I, I start with the soft pieces, sewing them all, and then you have to get in and you build all of this, like my hat and my vest and everything that's built out of foam. So I have to finish my stuff to the very tip top degree because when you go into cosplay competitions, people literally do what they call flipping your scenes. The judges will come and turn your costume inside out and look at every single thing to see the quality of the craftsmanship that you've done. So this is one that I competed in last year. I was um, Lucius Malfoy from Harry Potter. So. You have like a binder that shows your reference images, like what you were coming off of. So I have images from the movie and then you have your materials and then images of you actually making it. So I like 3D printed things and used a laser engraver on leather and all this kind of stuff for that one. And that's where this, and then I have all my swatches for fabrics and everything to show them the different techniques that you used. Brian has reached the master level in cosplay competition. But even then, there's never a lack of learning and discovering new creative techniques amongst his cosplay peers. I just competed in an online competition last month, and I met people literally from all over the globe that I'm in like a big group chat with now, and we're sharing how we make things, and like we look at each other's costume, and like, how did you do that? And then he'll show, someone will show you how to do something, you're like, oh, I would have never thought of that. So yeah. it's just this great community to be part of. What's even cooler, Brian brings these inspirations into his classroom and creates a safe space for his students to learn and be creative in a non-judgmental zone. I think that art is super important to my students to give them a different experience to be able to see the world outside of themselves. I do a Japanese art unit with them every year and a lot of Asian art, if you study Asian art history, it is much more interested in the process than the product. Creating the art is really the artwork and when the art is finished, like if you look at Tibetan sand paintings, that creating the art is the meditation, it is the art. When they're finished, the sand just goes away and they don't care. And my students, it blows their mind because in our culture, the product is more important than the process. They don't care how they get there as long as they achieve it. And to see them have that dawning on their, then that maybe the journey is just as important as the finishing, that's when I'm like, ah, oh, we've I've, I've reached them with something. And some of them are easier to reach than others, you know? But that's why I think art is so important. It just gives you a different, view on the world. Wow, and joining us now is, of course, Allie Martin, who did a great time. I have to say, Allie, this goes way beyond Halloween costumes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and honestly, to, to backtrack a little bit, 
This was a piece that when I walked into it, Brian is a true maker. He he obviously is producing these costumes. He does perler beads. He does a little bit of everything. And I had no idea that this was going to be the story that I was telling when I walked into this into the shoot. And I think I absolutely love that because I learned something new. Like you said, this goes beyond Halloween costumes. And there's a whole another world out there that is dedicated to the craft of you know, embodying a character and evolving into something that's outside of yourself and a different perspective in a creative way. Um, and I loved his comment about flipping the scenes. His, that got me because the, the judges in these conventions and these competitions really look for the attention to detail. And he, he's, he's got it. <laughs> Uh, right quick, Allie, uh, j just a little bit of time left, but you, I heard you, I heard either you or him use the word non-judgmental in talking about this. Uh, yes. Why is that so important? Um, this is extremely important. So as I mentioned, he's a high school art teacher, and he had mentioned to me, which unfortunately I had to cut out of the piece, that growing up, you know, art was his safe space, and he was a little bit more on the nerdy, quote-unquote, geeky side and loves the Comic-Con scene and, and all that. So he really wants to bring that to his students who also enjoy the same things because he had made a comment that he was bullied when he was younger, and he wants to make sure that his students have a safe space to be creative and express themselves and wave their flag, so to speak, whatever that may be. Got it, got it. Yeah. All right, Allie, great job, thank you for that. Now, next, coming up here on Cincy Lifestyle, we address a serious topic tied to a national day. It's PTSD Awareness Day, and a member of the Disabled American Veterans will be here to talk about this disease and some ways you can help veterans while staying socially distant. And then we learn how to make a handy chicken wire basket. That's right, it's perfect for gardening. Our friend from Woodcraft will teach us how to make it we have all that and so much more right after the break. Welcome back. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a big problem amongst our veterans. It affects more than 11% of Iraq and Afghanistan vets, 12% of Gulf War vets, about 15% of Vietnam veterans. Question is, how can you spot this disorder and what can you do to help? Well, here to tell us a little bit more about it is Dan Clare from Disabled American Veterans. Dan, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thanks for having us. So, so let's kind of uh, all get on the same page here about what PTSD is and, and what it can, how it can sometimes present in veterans. Well, DAV um, was founded here in Cincinnati 100 years ago, and throughout our entire history, we've been dealing in one form or another with the symptoms um, and psychological trauma that veterans face. Um, in 1977, we funded the research that actually led to PTSD being recognized, and that's something I think Cincinnati folks should be pretty proud of. Um, PTSD comes in a lot of varieties. You know, it's it's everything from um, from very mild symptoms occasionally to uh, it can be very debilitating as well. So we're talking about in some cases people reliving events. Um, in some cases, they avoid certain situations. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, you know, people just they, you can't unlearn certain things, and and they're they're kind of hyper vigilant. But uh, it comes in all varieties, and it's pretty common in civilians too. Okay, and so when, when it comes to helping veterans, or in, in this instance, as you point out, civilians who are struggling with PTSD, what are some things they can do to, to cope? You know, I think the most important thing you can do is get mental health treatment. Um, it, for veterans, if you're in a crisis, call the VA crisis line. It's there, it's available 24 hours a day. You can chat online. Um, you can call 800-273-8255 if you're in a crisis. Um, but you know, there's, there's other things that you can do if, if you're, if you're suffering, uh, from PTSD and you're not being compensated and you're in a position where you're not working, certainly we want to help you get your benefits and, and take care of you that way. Okay. Uh, as we show some video from a movie that, uh, kind of addresses this issue, some civilian agencies, police departments, for instance, are waking up to the necessity of being careful how they deal with veterans and help veterans through crises. What about the rest of us? What do we need to know? 
to help veterans? You know, veterans don't ask for a whole lot of recognition. They're very humble people. Um, but you would be surprised. Um, we did a pulse survey, a veterans pulse sur survey a few years ago, and we found that um, while veterans are humble, 85% appreciate it if someone they don't know just says a simple thank you. Um, so, so that is a thing. I, I, I would say one thing, you know, we're coming up on 4th of July. Um, I, I wouldn't go overboard or make veterans feel more isolated or more different necessarily um, because you're worried about 4th of July and fireworks and things like that. Um, but it's important just to keep in mind that, that some people have those limitations based on their PTSD. And because of that, um, we really should honor them because they, in the case of veterans, certainly sacrificed for our country. Absolutely, they did. Uh, Dan, right quick, uh, let's help people get more information and resources uh, from the DAV to help veterans and for veterans themselves to find help. How do they do that? You know, the best way to do it is to visit our website, DAV.org. We have a resource page there um, about PTSD, so people can learn more about it that way. Um, also, if veterans are, are experiencing a loss of employment directly related to COVID, they can go to our website and we're giving out relief grants for them. Um, and also, uh, you know, there's employment resources, help with benefits, everything. Um, if you need claims assistance, we encourage veterans to call us at 888-604-0234 uh, weekdays from 9 to 4. And our office here in, in Cold Spring across from NKU is open. Um, veterans need to bring a mask to wear. Um, but we're happy to help them with their claims and, and get them connected and, and make them feel like they're part of our community again. All right, Dan, thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you, Clyde. Thank you very much. Indeed. Mona? Well, with summer in full swing, it's time for gardening and visiting farmers markets. But why carry a plain old canvas bag when you could make an adorable chicken wire basket? And that's what we're going to do today. And of course, here to teach us how to do it is John Denny with Woodcraft of Cincinnati. Always good to have you, John. Thanks, Mona. Always Thank great to be so here. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, tell us how to get started. What tools do we need? Well, I went ahead and pre-cut the pieces, but a little coping saw. This can be done with a minimal amount of uh, tools. A little okay. coping saw to cut your, your um, profile, your, your uh, circle. <laughs> Wonderful. And um, the wood is cypress, mm -hmm. so it's an excellent outside the wood, outdoor wood. This is just gorgeous. I love the, how this is going to eventually turn out. Well, what I like about this with the chicken wire, you're out in your garden, you load everything up before right. you take it in the house, you take the garden hose and just spray all your vegetables and fruits and that flowers and everything the advantage. Mm -hmm. All right, so what do we have to do? What are we doing today? Well, we're going to start off. We already made our sides and we're going to get you to drill the I'm putting on my safety glasses, That's safety John. first. Okay, safety first. And we'll get you to drill this one here. All righty. Now watch your fingers, John. Oh, I okay. trust you. And we're going to drill this mm -hmm. hole. Mm -hmm. And what we did was, what you did and was. you still have your fingers. I have all my fingers. And you drilled a little recess. This is a countersink. Okay. So that the, the head of the screw oh. will be flush or maybe just a little bit below the wood. Okay, and this is a countersink. This is a countersink, which you okay. just used right there. Now, okay. what we're going to do is we'll put the screwdriver tip into here. So how hard is this scale of 1 to 10? Oh, this, with the right tools, it's very easy. And oh. the right tools being minimal tools, a staple gun a coping saw. Um, uh, what else did I, some did we use? Wire. Some chicken wire, some wood. Yes. The whole project was less than $15. Oh, wow. Um, no finish at all. Cypress is an excellent outdoor wood. Okay. Um, it grows in a swamp, so it's very good. <laughs> now, what and we're going to get you to do yeah. is, I'm, oh, I have all the faith <laughs> in the world in you. I have faith in me. <laughs> So we're going to attach the staple wire, mm -hmm. I mean the, the chicken wa wire. Mm -hmm. Here you go ahead. With a staple gun. Mm -hmm. Okay, take right that. here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just squeeze the handle. One more. And. All Excellent. right. Now what I like to do, take this and just give those staples a little tap. Oh. Mm-hmm. Show them okay. who's boss. Now, go ahead and take your uh, drill again. My drill? Mm -hmm. Okay. Clyde, this, it's this, my drill. This is the Mona drill. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have history, <laughs> me and this drill. <laughs> and I'm going to hold this steady. And you're going to hold it. So is it good to have two people maybe to, to help you? Oh, an extra set of hands is always good. Okay. Oh, a little bit more. More? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, if you say so, John. There you go. Oh. And we are going to. This is easy. It is. You know what? I'm going to, no, you're fine. Hang on to that. This is easy. Okay, John, you know, people might want to, a little bit of help. You talked mm -hmm. about extra hand. So where can they reach you and get some classes? Come to our store. We're up on uh, 11 7 Princeton Pike up by Tri-County Mall. Okay. About a mile south of I-275 and 747 or Princeton Pike exit. Um, we're open seven days a week. And if you're looking for a specific class and we don't have it listed, say yeah. something. Odds are, if, if you're interested in it, so are other people. And I'm sure we have somebody that can teach the subject. Well, John, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so Thank much. You. It was All right. And we're back. Uh, we're in the summertime weather pattern. Going to be warmer, more humid. Possibility for some thunderstorm showers out there. So be advised, Mona. Thank you, Clyde. And that's it for Cincy Lifestyle Friday, June 26th. Hey, be sure to watch us next week. We've got some great shows ready for you, including dusting off that waffle maker and making <laughs> sure we're going to teach you how to use it in a variety of ways. So enjoy your weekend and be sure to make it a great day. for watching our video. If you liked what you saw, hit that subscribe button. You can also check out full episodes of the show you've never seen before or watch your favorites again and again. And as always, make it a great day.